Hi everyone, in this video of Accelerated Chess Dragon, we're going to be looking at a game played between Bobby Fischer and Miguel Nydorf. This was played in the 1966 Platygorsky Cup in Santa Monica, the United States. And without further ado, let's look at this game. Fischer starts by playing the move e4, and Nydorf plays c5. Knight f3, and now knight c6. d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, e6, and now knight to b5. And this is the Taimanov variation. And in this particular case, uh, white is trying to put his knight into the d6 square. So black plays d6, and now Fischer plays bishop f4, to which Nidorf responds e5. Bishop e3, and now knight to f6, uh, trying to challenge the e4 pawn. We have bishop g5 now. Bishop g5 is trying to double black's pawns. The reason is because if bishop takes f6 is played, and queen takes f6 is the recapture, then the knight will come into c7 and grab the rook on a8. Although doubling the pawns in this position isn't actually that bad, in fact, it's part of theory when one player would play something like a6, and then bishop f6 would be played, gf6, and then this knight will usually retreat somewhere else, and black will usually try to push f5. And this is what happens in the game. So a6, bishop f6, gf6, knight goes back, and now not playing f5 in this particular moment, but knight d4 instead. And knight d4 is just trying to centralize the knight, perhaps bring the rook to c8. Bishop c4 by white. b5 attacking the bishop, and also saying that if this bishop moves somewhere other than capturing this bishop on e6, then b4 can be played to fork both of these knights. Bishop takes e6 was played, f takes e6, and now knight e2 getting away from the fork, and now knight c6 by Nidorf. Knight to g3, Fischer finds a way to remaneuver his knight. Queen d7, and now c4. And Nidorf here just returns the knight to d4, mainly because there is now no pawn which can kick the knight away. But one of Fischer's knights are going to do that job. So castles b4 and knight c2. Nidorf intentionally brought the knight back to c2 so that it could kick the knight on d4 away. So that's what happens, and now h5. And Nidorf's plan is just trying to uh, get a kingside attack, not really worrying about the king's safety, but just going to go full on out against the white king. So rook fd1, h4, knight goes back to f1, and now rook to g8. The idea is that now you have a rook lined up on the g-file, and sooner or later there could be ideas like queen g7, uh, which would line the queen up against the g-file, and maybe you could also find a way of developing this bishop to h6 uh, to guard e3 in case this knight on f1 ever wants to help defend via the e3 square. So here we have a3 trying to challenge the b4 pawn, and before, of course, trading the pawns, Nidorf is trying to create some complications. So he plays h3. Now only after the pawn has moved to g3, Nidorf plays the move b takes a3. We have rook takes a3, queen c6, uh, lining the queen on the c file, and also, in cases, defending the a6 pawn. And now queen to e2. So what queen to e2 is trying to do is it's trying to bring the queen over to h5 and somehow find a way to maybe get rid of that h3 pawn. f5 is played c5. Now, and c5 is a very interesting move, and the idea that Fischer wanted to employ in this position when he played c5 is actually quite creative. Uh, if d takes c5 is played here, then white will go for queen h5 check, and you must play the king somewhere, so you would have to play something like king e7, and now this rook comes to d3. And the entire idea of this was to basically bust open the d-file and make sure that that d6 pawn wasn't defending it. Because in that same scenario, without c5 being played, this would not really be possible because rook d8 is there. But now, if you play rook d8, you just lose a whole rook. So, uh, after rook a to d3 is played, 
uh, this would be just too much for Nidorf to handle, and he would lose the game quite soon. So instead of playing the move d takes c5, Nidorf just goes for queen takes e4. Queen takes c5 is another move to actually consider, but that wouldn't be as good as well because there's queen h5 check, and after, say, king e7 or king d7, uh, e takes f5, and the material is equal, but after this, the position for Nidorf is getting too exposed, and this is just too hard to play. So we have queen takes e4, grabbing this pawn, hoping for a queen trade, and that is exactly what Nidorf gets. But after c takes d6, there are tripled pawns on the e file, and this can be a very easy. This can be a very big weakness for Nidorf later on, mainly because it's going to be so easy to capture all of those pawns. Because first of all, there's barely going to be any pieces defending those pawns. And secondly, because uh, even if you could defend those pawns, uh, there are more pieces that can attack them than defend them. So essentially, the idea is that Fisher will regain one or two of those pawns, and essentially uh, he would be in good shape in that case. So Bishop h6 is played to try stopping moves like Rook e3 and piling up on the e4 pawn. So Fischer just plays rook a5, attacking the pawn from this perspective. And you may think that bishop f4 is a move that could be played because it defends the e5 pawn, but after white just plays the calm king h1, you have to move the bishop again, you lose e5, and then there's a fork on e4 and e6, and there's not a way to defend both of these points. So, hence, uh, you should not play the move bishop f4. Instead, king d7 was played, giving up the e5 pawn and the e4 pawn, uh, and after bishop takes b2, knight e3 is played. So, Fischer has exchanged the queens, um, gotten rid of a few pawns, and that h3 pawn is also a very weak pawn that could be rounded up soon, and he's also trying to get his knight into the game via c4, and maybe from there, b6. So, here, a5 was played, knight c4, and now rook g to b8, defending the bishop on b2, and also protecting knight b6 check, which could have won an exchange. Rook h4, uh, threatening to pick up the pawn on h3, but also giving a threat of rook h7 check, uh, which would infiltrate via the 7th rank. King c6, and now rook h7, doing just that. Bishop d4, check, king d5, and now d7. And this is a very tough position for Nidorf to play, mainly because it's hard to defend the queening square, uh, with the fact that uh, there could be pressure on this d4 bishop, and you need to be very careful about that. And here, Nidorf actually plays the move a4, which unfortunately is not the best move to play. Uh, one would probably think that a better move could be rook d8, and trying to defend it this way, but there are also ways that this can be losing, because there is knight b6 check, and after king d6, uh, knight takes a8 to win. Uh, you could also just think about uh, directly playing knight b6 check here, and that is after... And after a4, that is exactly what Fischer does. Rook takes b6 is played, but now rook c8. And this is the main idea. You're going to win the exchange, and it's just going to be an easy win from there. So, uh, rook d6, defending the queening square, uh, captures on a8, captures on d7, and now Fischer also grabs the a4 pawn. So, now if we assess the material, uh, Fischer is up in exchange and a pawn, and it's only a matter of time before Nidorf uh, resigns the game. e5, uh, defending the bishop, king f1, rook b7, perhaps trying to find a way to get to a an attacking point, uh, like b2, and uh, try to attack along the second rank, but Fischer plays the move f4. And the idea is that you cannot take with e takes f4, because you lose your bishop on d4. So, you must, after f4, play king e6, mainly because after f takes e5, there is an attack on the d4 bishop, and you cannot really defend the d4 bishop, so you would really lose it. So king e6 would have to be played, which is what happened, f takes e5, rook f7 check, king e2, 
And now Rook F2 check. Nidorf tries to get as much counterplay as he can in these last few moves. And after Bishop E5, Rook E1 was played by Fischer. And after Rook E1 was played, Nidorf resigned the game. There's absolutely nothing he can do because he's, first of all, down in exchange, down a pawn, and also because Fischer is going to be exchanging the rook, both of the rooks, for the rook and bishop. So if you don't understand what I mean, uh, it goes like this. There's essentially no way for Nidorf to actually defend this bishop by moving his king. Uh, if you go king d5, then there's rook a5 check. Uh, and then you lose the bishop. If you go king d6, then rook a6 check, uh, and you must move the king back. Or if you go to c5 or d5, then rook a5 check wins the bishop. So, after all of this, you cannot play anything that would defend the bishop with the king, so you must play rook f5. But, that is exactly what Fischer wants Nidorf to play. Here, Fischer could just play rook takes e5 check, actually. He doesn't have to even play rook a5 and pile up on the bishop. He can just capture the bishop directly, because it doesn't matter which way you capture, you're going to lose. Uh, you're going to get the rooks exchanged, and in that sense, also you're going to be losing. Uh, for instance, if you play rook e5, then there is rook e4, and you must exchange the rooks. Uh, so after this, white would be completely better. And also, if you play the move king takes e5, then after rook a5 check, king e6, rook takes f5. King takes f5, this is already winning for white. You will just play the move king e3, and after king g4, just king e4, and white's king is infiltrated into the position. A very brilliant victory for Bobby Fischer. So I hope you all enjoyed the video, and if you have any suggestions or feedback for me, please let me know in the comment section, and stay tuned for more chess.